Welcome back. Hope you had a a good weekend. We're going to start it off and uh, see what happens. Uh, Every week is amazing now. I've never seen anything like it. We used to have a big story about once every, what, a couple of months and kick around in the press for for a couple of weeks, and then it would slowly fade away. We get these stories now once or twice, three times a week. Uh, But one of the biggest stories I have ever seen in my life is nowhere to be seen. It's gone, and it just broke yesterday, actually on the 16th, and it vanished, which is not unusual when you put something important in front of the American people. It's a combination of attention span, our attention deficit, and mainstream media confabulation with all the intel agencies and criminals that are running this country. The story is simple. Here's a headline from RT. $21 trillion of unauthorized spending by United States government discovered by economics professor. $21 trillion. I'm beginning to think now that most people can't even imagine what a trillion dollars is to begin with, and it makes it easier for the mainstream media to hide this stuff, put it away, file it, it's gone. Twenty-one trillion dollars. Now, to talk about that with us tonight is my friend of a long time. She is a a marvelous treasure of American patriotism, wisdom, uh, knowledge, and, and a lot of other things as well, as you'll find out tonight. Catherine Austin Fitz is back to talk about this. She figures uh, intimately with this story in terms of a journalist because it has to do with something that she, and I think on, on this program the last time she was here, she did mention that six and a half or so trillion dollars was essentially missing. And we talked about that, and that is what led to the current story of $21 trillion. I'm going to play a little bit of of a, a video in just a minute with uh, Dr. Mark Skidmore, who is involved with this, and actually was the one who came out with the, the big story on, on the 16th. Hello, Catherine. Thanks for being here again. Jeff, thank you, and thank you for such kind words coming from you. What a high compliment that is. Well, you you deserve every every single word. I probably didn't even come close to telling the enormity of your contribution to our country, and you have paid a terrible price over the years for standing up for the truth and for what but used I to be. I now associate with all the best people. <laughs> yes. I dare say when I was assistant secretary, you would have not been so nice to me. <laughs> well, who knows? I don't know. That's a, that's an unusual thing. Uh, this When you were on last time, did we not talk about six plus trillion dollars missing? Right. So, the, so I started to cover the missing money in fiscal 1999, and I've been writing about it since... What happened during the Clinton administration is large amounts of money started to go missing and have kept going missing. Uh, But the biggest number was in fiscal 2015, which is when we have the largest, uh, the last audits. Uh Uh-huh. The Department of Defense was missing $6.5 trillion, and HUD was missing somewhere around $300 billion. (laughs) And that was the biggest number so far. And in fact... Right after the audit closed and before it was published, the, lar- the, the, the contractor that runs the payment systems, the information and payment systems, the largest one at DOD, spun their IT division out to a new company. In fact, it's a company, you'll laugh, Jeff, that does a lot of contracts in Antarctica. <laughs> oh, that is funny. That's and, good. And I, so I, <laughs> I put up an article on at Solaris called Lockheed Cuts and Runs because I figured, you know, they're going to get their liability off the corporate balance sheet. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, now, what's interesting is if you look at the other liability for information pay, payment systems, it's the New York Fed. And not that long after Dr. Skidmore published his first report, um, we had a report on a Saturday that the fire trucks had come to the New York Fed. A fire had started on the roof because apparently someone was using a fireplace, you know, an old fireplace that hadn't been used for a long time, and it started a fire. <laughs> so oh, that's wonder, pretty funny. they were burning down at the New York Fed yeah. on a yes. Saturday. <laughs> yes, yes, that's funny. That's funny. Isn't let, that let, funny? Yes, yeah, hilarious. Let, let me ask you just a, a kind of a generic question. When uh-huh. money goes missing... What the yeah. hell does that mean? Well, that's a very good question because the answer, the honest answer is we don't know. 
what what has happened is there are 21 trillion of undocumentable adjustments under the Constitution and the financial management laws. The executive branch or an agency thereof is not allowed to spend money without it being envisioned in an appropriation and without it being reported. Now there are exceptions to that for secret, you know. So so the process for the intelligence agency yeah, black is ops, more secretive okay, and, yeah, right. So so so, but in general, you can't spend it unless it's been appropriated and it's it's reported in the financials. So what what has happened is when the accountants have transactions which are not necessarily envisioned in an appropriation and for which there's no documentation, they can't explain them. And they could they're not just expenditures, they could be revenues. So for example, we see in one uh one instance and I think it was in two thousand fifteen when we had the six point five trillion mm-hmm. um go missing, the uh, the Treasury cha- transferred to the Army in one transaction eight hundred billion dollars. Now the Army's entire budget for years is hundred and twenty billion. So you're transferring six times the total budget in one transaction. Where's the oversight? You know, you think, how how can this happen? Well, how here's how it can happen. If Congress continues to appropriate Right. Despite so, so so let me just put this in perspective. Imagine if you got your bank statement and the bank said that you had let's say you had a thousand dollars in your bank account and the bank said that you only had a hundred dollars mm-hmm. and you took out your checking account balance, your check register, and you said undocumentable adjustment nine hundred and the bank said, Oh, we'll, we will we'll, you know, we won't lose it again. Would you do that? No, you'd say, look, I, I want to know where the 900 is. Get it back. Now. Now. <laughs> I want, you know, I'm not just going to pretend that I don't have time to dig in and figure out where, what the problem is. Uh-huh. You know, you would dig in. You would demand of to course. know, were you wrong with the bank wrong? And, and you'd get it reconciled. But you wouldn't just write $900 on documentable adjustments. No chance. So, so, so part of it is we have... We have all sorts of transactions happening for which there is not proper documentation and people can't explain what they were or where they went and why they're happening. That's number one. Number two, um, Congress continues to appropriate despite the fact that clearly the financial management is being run outside the law. Now, let's just say that there's a certain amount of transactions or documentation. You know, things go wrong. Right. So let's say in a, in an operation, you know, one to five percent would be considered not material. Now, given the size of the federal government, it is material because one percent, you know, of the of the in a six hundred billion dollar budget, sure, you sure, one percent is a, is billions of dollars. So it is important, but we're talking in about amount of undoc- undocumentable adjustments that is bigger than the entire budget. You know, so the undocumentable adjustments from fiscal 1998 to 2015, which is the last year we have, are greater than the entire budgets for HUD and DOD. Uh, now, so that's, uh, not, that's not just material. That is right, right. galactic in size. It's, sure it is. Now, for our listeners, does this money called undocumented, does it exist? And if it exists, for our listeners, where did it come from? So, so this money, in my opinion, is very real. And what's been very frustrating for me for the last 20 years is I've been trying to communicate to a wide variety of people that it was very real. But, but while we were growing the economy using debt, mm-hmm. by going off and borrowing just more and more government debt, whether it's the bailouts or quantitative easing or sure, sure. increasing treasury debt, you know, everyone in Washington just, just acted like money was free. Oh yeah, and you could just print more money. You could print more, you know, currency. You could print more treasuries, and it was all free. And and so, but you know, so while everybody seen there was plenty of dough and it was free, they figured, okay, well, it's not my problem. It won't affect my pension benefits. It won't, <laughs> you know, affect my social security. It won't affect my government contract. Right. And meantime, as you can imagine, if you have twenty one trillion of excess dollars pumping through the federal budget. That's a lot of corporate profits. That's a lot of rising stocks. Everybody's making money, right? It's incredible. It's very funny. A reporter said to me, but this can't happen. It can't be 
that this has gotten so far out of whack for so long and no one knew. And I said, listen, all the fake news programs are owned by big corporations. Who do you think is making a fortune on the absence of internal financial controls in the U.S. government? Yeah. What did he say? He said, I think I need to get better prepared. I'll call you back. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> yes. Well, he was a very good guy. You know, yeah, he, yeah, he couldn't yeah. fathom how could this be the case. And the beauty, here's how Dr. Skidmore got involved. Uh, hey, well, here, you want to hear? You want to me? Let, let's uh, hear. Let me, let's hear Dr. Skidmore oh, for 60 yeah. seconds. I got it right here. He's a uh, friend of yours and uh, put his face terrific, right on this. Terrific. You know, oh, yeah. an outstanding scholar. I can a real tell. Scholar, a I can tell scholar, by his yeah. voice uh, immediately. Here, take a listen, yeah. uh, friends. Here you go. Dr. S Mark Skidmore. Um, in short, I was, uh, last June, I was listening to an interview with Catherine, and um, she referred to a report that had come out in 2016 uh, by the Office of the Inspector General, and the charge of the OIG office is to um, provide some accountability and tracking of financial activity of the federal government. And so this, she had referred to a report that indicated in fiscal year 2015 that the Army, which has about a $122 billion budget, had $6.5 trillion in adjustments. And I'm familiar with um, state and local budgets. I've taught budgeting processes to new county commissioners. Um, and I know that things happen within government that, you know, sometimes it's not always up and up or, or sometimes you have an adjustment just because you don't have adequate uh, transactions. So the auditor, you know, receipts, et cetera. And so the auditor will just say, you know what, this is an unsupported adjustment. We have to account for this. And usually it's just a small portion of authorized spending, you know, maybe 1% at most. So for the Army, 1% would be about $1.2 billion of, of transactions that you just can't account for. You don't have adequate documentation. So when she said $6.5 trillion, I said, that cannot be right. It, it doesn't even, you know, it's not even in the realm. I thought maybe she meant $6.5 billion. And that would be a lot of money of, of you know, unaccountable transactions. Um, so I went and looked up the report myself and started reading it, and sure enough, it was $6.5 And I thought, what? How can this be? And so I started digging in, and I... Okay, this is Dr. Mark Skidmore. Now, uh, what other words, what other synonyms can we use for undocumented expenditures? Well, I call it the financial coup d'etat. In other words, you're talking about a change, a fundamental change in the governance structure through financial means. Very good. Very, very good. That sums it up. Yes. Uh, yes. And for all of you listening, the whole idea of budgets and balancing the books and all that clearly has means nothing to the controllers and the black ops and the deep well, state. It something because remember you have the civil service running well that's the their that's their that's their whitewashing that's their their window dressing on this whole thing well but here's the thing that if they were completely whitewashing they would never print figures and so you have among the civil service people who've had the integrity at least to give us some numbers sure because yeah i got it they know something's wrong and they're trying to communicate that yeah, can we call that this time. theft Catherine well here's what I would call it I would call it lawlessness lawlessness so right, we good. have we good. have excellent if you look at the provisions in the Constitution they're short and sweet but it's clear what you're supposed to do and if you look at the financial management laws they're quite good in terms of what you're supposed to do to run the financial management and operations of government and what you're supposed to do in accounting reporting. You know, the one thing that's missing is the one thing that will really work, which is place-based accounting. And that's what I litigated with the federal government about for 11 years was my efforts to do. I finally decided to do it privately. You know, why, why get government to do, why not just do it? Right. Anyway, so what they, you know, so they ended up seizing all our databases and, and software and putting it under lock and key for six years. So 
that's what that that fight was about. But the financial management laws, you know, without one exception, are quite good. And the reality is we're not following them. So there have been efforts by citizens to enforce um, and the courts have refused to give them standing. They've said, you know, if Congress wants to enforce, it can. And simply, Congress doesn't have to appropriate next year. They can freeze your appropriations or cut your appropriations until you're in compliance. But, of course, Congress is as out of control as the executive branch on this. And the reality is, if you look at everybody in Congress who's tried to do something about it, you know, they end up discovering, you know, they end up getting shot when they're playing baseball. Right. So, right. right. Or, you know, they end up being shot yeah. in a in a open car in Dallas. Yeah. So, right. So, so we've we're things are coming to a head because you could continue to do this, Jeff, as long as you could float the paper. And the reality is, if you look at how much tr- how much we've floated in terms of Treasury securities, mortgage securities, which is a big piece of this, or just dollars around the world, mm-hmm. you know, the world is reaching a capacity of what it's willing to tolerate in terms of currency debasement. Got it. And I think, you know... The shock that you've seen in Washington, and it's always portrayed through the media as a personal or a personality thing, but you have an entire world of people who engineered the financial coup, and their cost of capital in their minds is zero percent. And you have a team come into place that is saying, wait a minute, we need to get performance on the military. We need to get performance on the balance of trade. We can't just spend money. We can't just print money. You can't spend $4 billion on Air Force wants, you have to get, you know, uh, you have to get, so so you got a group of people who are talking like their cost of capital is 20%, which is a much more realistic, you know, figure. And and this is exactly, all last year I quoted the German finance minister who said in February 2016, he said, he said, the debt growth model is over. There are no reforms that aren't real reforms. And so what is happening, it's like we're coming out of a 20-year trance where people are waking hmm. up and saying, oh, you know these 21 trillion of undocumentable adjustments? Mm-hmm. It's real. It's real money. Yeah, and that's what we know about. That's not necessarily the cap, right? Right, because here's what we only went through. If you go to missingmoney.solary.com, um, so let me say it again, missingmoney.solary, S-O-L-A-R-I.com, and you click on DOD and HUD, what we did is we made a chart and we showed every year, both for the subparts of DOD and then HUD, every mm-hmm. year from 1998 to mm-hmm. 2015, right. and we put all the documents and we noted what page in the document. So you can go through and survey all of the work and you can count this up yourself. You don't have to depend on us. All the documentation is there completely open. Now, here's what's interesting. When we... Dr. Skidmore called me and he said, can I help? I said, oh boy, can you help? <laughs> At that point, I was up to about 12 trillion. And what he did was he went in with a, a group of students and they read hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of documentation. I mean, that's a big job to go through all the Inspector General reports and Controller reports from 1998 to 2015 for uh, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. I mean, that you're talking giant, big Giant, giant. Yeah. Right, because those are, those are documents. Each one of those documents can be 100, 200 pages long, and it's intense reading. Anyway, so, so they went through, and we got, we got it all up. And my understanding with him is I want all these documents on our server and linked to documents on our server. Uh-huh. We'll double link to their links, but I want these documents on our server before Darn we go right. public. And sure enough, yeah, yeah. right after we went public... They took all the documents down on the HUD and DOD Inspector General report on their websites, and then we made a big hullab. Dr. Skidmore did an addendum and made a big hullabaloo it on his different interviews. Guess what? They put them back up in a different location and said, oh, well, we were just reorganizing oh, the website. Right. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> that That's another uh, dark well, humor to sh- this. He, he, you know, he was shocked because he... He's a serious scholar, and he just published a great, he just co-authored a great article with Dr. Lawrence Kotlikoff, who's an economist from Boston University, who's, Mm -hmm. I would say, one of the most respected economists in the country, has done tremendous work on pension funds. And so here you have this co-authored by Kotlikoff and Skidmore, who are both pretty shocked that they did this. And then, boom, 
the, suddenly the documents are bad. I, I had to take one of my team and set them to work for three days finding the new links and posting that on the website. So. Well, congratulations <laughs> on that. Yeah, Solari, <laughs> S-O-L-A-R-I. Dot, go ahead and give, give them the, uh, yeah, give them the uh, so first. If you, if you go to our homepage at Solari.com, there's a big uh, poster on the left that says the Missing Money webpage. You can go to it that okay. way. Yeah. Or just go to missingmoney.solari.com. And what we, what we did, Jeff, there have been waves of disclosure on this problem, on the creeping financial coup at DOD and HUD. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, we have some of the past coverage, including a great scene of Cynthia McKinney reaming Donald Rumsfeld about, you know, who has the contracts, who's managing this money. Mm-hmm. And you have Donald Rumsfeld and his controller can't tell you who their contractors are. <laughs> they don't know. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, yeah, right. It's uh, an amazing video. That's that You can get that. But there's coverage. You know, there have been waves of coverage. And But what was remarkable was... Again, when I when Dr. Skidmore came and and offered to sort of lead this effort, uh-huh. I was up to about twelve trillion dollars, and literally, I would get these emails from him saying, "Oh my God, we found another trillion! <laughs> oh my God, we found another trillion!" So, so it's now up to twenty one trillion. But here's the thing: that's only at two agencies. That's why so I said this, this is not two the cap, agencies. right? Right, it's not the total, and and in many years they wouldn't put a number. So we don't know what the real number is. Oh, man. Wow. All right. Hold on, dear friends. We will be right back. Uh, look under Catherine and guests, and you'll see the video I just played a portion of. The story's there. She's been the, the, the genesis of this entire revelation, which is a financial coup. Uh, wow. Wow. And more. Back after this. Okay, welcome back. Uh, talking with Catherine Austin Fitz. One day, Catherine, we'll have some fun and talk about crypto. Uh, but not tonight. <laughs> 21 tri- How? All right. Short answer. So here's the thing. If yeah, go I, ahead. If I can steal $21 trillion, uh-huh. I assure you I have the resources to manipulate and manage the bond market, the stock market, you got the precious it. metals market and the crypto market. In fact, if you look at what I'm I'm hacking on cryptos, that's enough to manipulate the crypto market. <sighs> wow. All right. Are we talking about the elite of the elite, the Illuminati of the Illuminati, the world control mechanism? What are we talking? Who are who are these guys? So what you know, if you go back and you look at the history of the development of the hidden system of finance and the black budget, it mm-hmm. makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. So. You know, this has a long and deep history. 47 Act, then the 49 Act, we create the black budget. We seize the money from the Japanese and the Germans and create the hidden system of finance. You know, and some of that money goes into the exchange stabilization fund, which is then set up to manipulate right. and manage. Well, we the got market. Yamashita's gold. I mean, well, that right. was a we huge recovery, gold. big we score. Open, we open the United States up to narcotics. Yeah which is one of the great capital generators, you know, of the Western world. You know, we we watched Shanghai. We learned how Shanghai checked it, and we brought it back and did it ourselves. And then, you know, the big punch through comes when when Bush becomes vice president and gets control of the enforcement and intelligence lines after having been the... That's George Herbert Walker for you listening. And he, what he does is he creates through executive orders the ability to have private corporations do highly classified functions. Mm-hmm. So what you've now done by adding that to the 47 and the 49 Act and the, what you've done in the ESF and the hidden system of finance, you've basically put the intelligence business, intelligence agencies of the business of being the most powerful banker in the world, number one, and you combine that with their covert operations capacity. But then you say, okay, we can use the federal credit and issue bonds to create an unlimited stream of privately owned and controlled black technology and stock market profits. It's a whole black economy. It's that, it's that shadow economy that we've talked about for many years on the program. But it's even bigger 
than most well, people me, can imagine. Yeah, so let me keep going. So during the 80s, we see the development of financial fraud. And, you know, the same group that basically assassinated Kennedy in 63, you know, the fraud grows and grows, and they can't believe during the 80s, it's called Iran-Contra, how much they got away with it. Mm -hmm. And then I was part of the cleanup who came in in 89, you know, so we cleaned up the Iran-Contra fraud. Well, then they came back and they did it again. And what happened with the housing bubble in the 90s is you saw the same people, the same tools, the same deals. But this time, they they added the stock market and derivatives, which took it global and turbocharged it. And Got so, it. And, and, and basically what happened when you passed the Uruguay round of GATT and created the WTO in 95, I'll never forget, I was working, you know, I, in the Bush administration, I became convinced that these guys were going to get a hold of the technology and basically turn the world into a, you know, a dictatorship. So I became convinced that entrepreneurs had to get the, the tools mm -hmm. and basically re-engineer the economy and, and come up with... Oh, that was your motivation different. this whole time. I get it. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I said, look, we're, you know, what we need is a decentralized thing, basically a decentralized model that create, can create more wealth and tyranny. Because that, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to get me started on the economic problems of tyranny, mm -hmm. and that's not the major problem with tyranny in the first place. But anyway, so freedom is much more economically productive. It produces a much bigger pie than tyranny. So anyway, so off I went, and um, what basically happened was there was a decision instead to do a financial coup. So I, I presented my findings to a, a, list, a group of the top pension fund advisors in the country, mm -hmm. and my pitch was if we re-engineer the government investment to be environmentally and economically healthy for people in places on a place-based basis, the pension funds will make a fortune. They'll be able to pay the boomers' retirement, and the taxpayer will be hugely better off. We'll all be better off. So I made the presentation in spring of 1997. Remember, the fiscal year started that October, October 1997, for the fiscal Who did you present to? So I presented to the top pension fund leaders in the country who were on a board. They were on the advisory board of one of my subsidiaries at Hamilton. Okay. Okay. And the president of CalPERS, the largest pension fund in the country, was there, a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. And I showed, him, I showed them a pro forma of how we could re-engineer the federal investment for the Philadelphia area. We're out at, a, at Safeguard Scientific outside of Pennsylvania, one of the top investors there. And, and I showed the presentation, and the, and the president of CalPERS froze, and he looked at me, and he said, you don't understand. It's too late. I said, what do you mean it's too late? It's not too late. I said, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's not, it's not too late at all. There's plenty of time, plenty of room to turn the ship around. He said, you don't understand. He said, they've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out starting in the fall, which was fall of 1998. He said, you've got to get to Nick Brady. Nick Brady had been the chairman of Dylan Reed and then the secretary Nicholas of Treasury. Nicholas Brady, so. yeah. Right. So I, I had worked for Nick when I was at Dylan Reed, so I knew Nick Brady. So he said, you've got to get to Nick because they've given up on the country. They're moving all the money out. Now, I thought, Jeff, what he meant was they're reallocating the pension funds to invest in the emerging markets. I was wrong because it was exactly that October 1st when all the money started to go missing. And there was huge money just flying out of the government, and it was turning up, you know, and all these different investors were suddenly getting a billion, two billion dollars to invest in China, and you think, where's all this money coming from? And in fact, I started to uh, do diligence. I was looking for where they were laundering these billions of dollars, and that's why I started to look so ca carefully and write about Enron, uh -huh. because one of my theories was that Enron was laundering all the money being pulled out of DOD and HUD, and I will bet you a dollar now that I've looked at what they were doing on the Clinton Foundation, I will bet you the money being stolen out of HUD was what funded and founded the Clinton Foundation, the Blair Foundation, um, and Jeffrey Epstein's operation. Wow. Wow. The Clintons used to talk about being millionaires. And I said, no, no, they're billionaires. And, and when you look, <laughs> you look at Haiti alone, $7 billion there, and 95% of it went missing. Uh, well, but remember, just... they were they were leading an entire syndicate. Yes, so they, they were, were the they were the, they were the visible front pieces. I understand. Right. So, so that syndicate, there were a lot of people on the on the take in that syndicate, and I think that's 
part of the shock you're seeing in Washington is, you know, one, you have a whole society that's used to operating with a 0% cost of capital. Uh But the other thing is, if you look at the paoli that was probably flying into thousands of pockets from that pay-to-play network, it was extensive. And, of course, you know, unfortunately, in that kind of environment, if it makes you money, it's good. And that's how people feel about it. So I don't know how much went into the Clintons' offshore account. My or, you know, God, is this big. It was, it's very big. What is what is the reaction uh, that you're getting from your sources and your people in, in government now? Do, do they understand the enormity of this coup? So my impression, Jeff, for because I started to try and get people to pay attention to this in 99. And we had a significant effort going. There was a wonderful reporter for Insight Magazine who wrote a series of stories. You can find it at Mm missingmoney.salary.com. And it all worked up to a big cover story that was going to be, you know, half of Insight Magazine, which automatically went to the Senate and the House offices. So this was going to be really big. And um, we'd been working on it for months, and we thought it was really going to explode the story. And Senator yes. Byrd had started to cover it, and Cynthia McKinney was on it, Dennis Kucinich, a couple of the Congress people were on it. So we uh-huh. thought it was really going to explode. And then um, on December 10th, it was going to run September 15th. On September 10th, Donald Rumsfeld gave a press conference admitting to the $2.3 trillion. We thought he was trying to get ahead of the story because we knew it would blow on September 15th. Well, it well, never ran. Yes. It ran several weeks later, and we know what happened. Yes, indeed. Right. And here's what's interesting. If you look at the mortgage fraud involved, I believe, in, in the missing money story, uh-huh. many of those companies went down or got impacted and many of the offices that were doing the investigation of those companies came down in the towers. And then, of course, whatever hit the Pentagon hit the office that was doing that. Well, the auditors were in there, correct? All the, money. Right. the paperwork, the auditors killed them all, basically. Right. Uh, cruise missile, no doubt, something like that. Uh, it right. targeted, and they're gone. But if you, if you look and at the OKC all bill, of, remember, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, if you look at the records... Related to the missing money and the sec- because you said to me, how could you steal that much money? Securities fraud is how you steal that much money. Oh. So if you look at all the records that were blown up in the SEC, FBI, and those different offices, and uh-huh. as we know, uh-huh. suddenly, right after 9/11, there were massive settlements between the SEC and Department of Justice and the different securities firms. And, of course, many records were blown up. The Army, for several years, said they couldn't produce financial statements because all, you know, their whole capacity had blown, blown up, which I don't begin to understand since it's out to, supposed to be out in Ohio, but that's what they said. At that point, you had the guy running the Army who was a former uh, executive of Enron. <laughs> this is astonishing. Just incredible. Stuff up. No, so, no. So he, but he, here's – I've never been able – it wasn't until Dr. Skidmore – that I was able to get the capacity to really have someone go through, survey the work, and look at it from the point of view who's somebody who's a serious scholar in the area of... Well, he and his grad students uh, came to the rescue, for sure. Yeah, no, that was definitely the cavalry. And um, because this is something that is so extraordinary and so big... It's not. It's too big for certainly for one set of eyes. You you need many smart people looking at it. I think the reason it hasn't gotten traction is people are afraid. What you're talking about is a budget, a federal budget that is financing two civilizations and pretending one doesn't exist. I have talked to so, people about this over the years. In theory, now we have fact. Right. So this is not the Clintons making a lot of money. This is not Goldman Sachs partners no, no. with all no, 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 financing no. Ferraris. No, you're talking about secret space programs, underground bases, high tech weaponry. You're talking about, you know, sort of watch the James Bond movies. It's not like they haven't explained what's going on. <laughs> you know, you make a wonderful point. It's been right there. They don't hide it. Right. It's there. Uh, well, it's really 
funny. You know, one, I always try to tell people, here's how the money works in America. Uh-huh. You know, Tony Soprano runs the local narcotics and, and HUD fraud. And if you don't believe me, watch the Soprano TV show. They had four shows on, you know, the basic HUD fraud model, how it works. It was quite, and they how did a funny. very good job. You, you must anyway, have been so, just so, beside yourself looking at some of this well, stuff. Well, I'll tell you a story about that that's really funny. So Tony Soprano is basically running the mortgage fraud and the drugs. But if the soccer moms get together and shut Tony Soprano down in the neighborhood, the next thing you know, they have James Bond coming down on their head with black helicopters. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the story of Gene Duffy and Linda Ives in Mena, Arkansas? Go ahead. You know, so, yeah. so Linda Ives is just trying to find out who killed her son and why. And the that's next all. thing you know, she's got black black helicopters coming down. And on that's her. right. That's and that's right. because it's very centralized. You have you have illegal cash flows. You know, whether it's narcotics trafficking, mortgage fraud, or the government. She's, these are tidal waves, not cash right. flow. These are huge. Right, but this is a highly leveraged, centralized operation. And, you know, it's hungry. It's cash hungry. You know, may, may I say one thing? Hold that thought. Sure. Uh, I have always said on this program for 24 years now that those running the black ops, how much people say, well, how much money do they have? And I would simply say as much as they need, as much as they right. want. That's as it. They and you, you just mentioned deep space. Now, people say, well, we, we had the Apollo program. We know about NASA's budget. They don't have the money. How could they possibly? Friends, there is a deep space program, and it is far, far down the road from where you think it is. And if you listen to some of the William Tompkins interviews I did, Bill, Bill knew, others have known. But bottom line is, again, how much money do these people have? As much as they want. Well, Got I'll it? I'll give you a little theory. So this is, as Dr. Farrell would say, this is high-acting speculation. But one of the things that happened starting in the 80s with the Iran-Contra fraud, if you go back and talk to the people who were doing the fraud, um, you know, the first thing that happened was they couldn't believe they got away with it, but they just kept doubling down. The more they got away with it, they just keep doubling (laughs) down and doing more and more and more. But here's the other thing. It was as if somebody said, I don't care. Go get as much money as you possibly can as fast as you can. Because the question is, Jeff, that was hard for me to understand, was there were so many people who had to go along with this. It, you know, it's not, you can't get, you can't bust through all those internal financial controls without a lot of consensus, particularly in the period from 1947 to 1980. Mm-hmm. So what got all those people to go along? Why did they think it was, you know, and, and you listen to them talk about the narcotics trafficking and destroying neighborhoods. They would say it's the best. It's the best of a lot of bad alternatives. We had to keep it secret. So I'm not saying I agree with them, but, but what got everybody to go along? Well, I could never understood. I could never understand what caused This incredible, it's like somebody took the gas pedal and just slammed it to the floor starting in the early 80s. -hmm. And I thought, what was that? What was that? And then I read Norm Berglund's Rings of Saturn. Oh, God, Norman used to be on this program with those pictures. Yes. The Voyagers passed Saturn and saw the things in the ring. Yep. And you know what it reminds me of? I used to have a St. Bernard who would never move. And then I took him to the stable one day, he saw my horse, he went crazy, and thank God I had him on a leash, because he tried to kill the horse. It's the first time I'd show him, seen him show any vitality whatsoever, but what he saw for the first time in his life was a dog that was bigger than he was. That's funny. You know? Yes. Right. And I think when they saw the things in the ring, they said, you know, they went into high alpha male alert and said, you know, these guys could kill us all. This is That's that, that I rem- no, no, I, right. I'm not going to say I broke the story here. I might have. I don't know. But I had Norman on this program. It has to be. God, it's got to be close to 20 years ago. And he brought that book out with the rings of Saturn, right. I think was the name of it. And we had the pictures on. He was on a number of times. And nobody paid much attention to it. They said, nah, come on, it's got to be something else. What, what those pictures showed, ladies and gentlemen, was mining operations in the rings of Saturn. Do you understand? And it wasn't right. us, okay? Right. There were chunks right. of the rings being mined, taken away. And Norman was able to prove that with, with photography. It was astonishing right. what he did. 
I hope he's but, still alive. I don't know if he is or he isn't, but well, he's a what remarkable. happened? In 2014, there were a group of us who gathered in San Mateo to do the Secret Space Program Conference 2014. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had Farrell did the Hidden System of Finance, and then I did the History of the Black Budget and all the different laws that have grown into the financial coup d'etat. Because I think one of the things that happened with the financial coup upon – because my theory is the reason we globalized so hard and fast in 95 is so that we could – basically re-engineer the global economy so that as quickly as possible we could become a multi-planetary civilization. So I think a lot of the centralization has been about pooling the capital and creating the engineering capacity hmm. to to make it into space in a very big way and become mm-hmm. a multi-planetary mm-hmm. civilization. Mm-hmm. And that implies all sorts of things for the financial system and how you operate the currency and the equity markets. And you know, So a lot of things that don't make sense to the average financial person or the citizen, you know, makes sense once you look at it from that point of view. If you say, look, how do we become a multi-planetary civilization as quickly as possible? So it starts to make sense. So, so, but I think part of what they did was they said, you know, the U.S. government and the reserve currency may not last forever. We want to pull enough money out. We want to privatize enough capital Mm -hmm. to then be able to run what we do on a private basis. So if you look at, so so let's say we got 27 trillion with the bailouts, we got 21 trillion in missing money, Mm -hmm. we got five to ten on the pump and dump of the telecoms and and some other sort of shenanigans. Mm -hmm. You know, at that point you're you're you've gone beyond 50 trillion. Well, what's five percent on 50 trillion? Yeah. What's the dividend on? You know, that's enough yeah. to run yeah. a global government oh, hell yes. on dividends oh, and interest. Absolutely. And then you look at the story that came out uh, two days ago: uh, the Pentagon secret UFO program with uh, Harry Reid and Bob Bigelow, and and they spent they've spent twenty two million dollars secretly studying UFOs. I, this that is an insult. That story to anybody who's been studying this. Truth and reality of UFOs and ETs. The government and the military have known about this for at least 75 or 80 years. At least. Here's the thing. Here's my question, and and we're not going to cover it tonight, but I think my question is, was that white out for the real Harry Reid story on Uranium One and what's happened in the Bundy case? We've had a breakthrough in the Bundy case. I know. Yes. It's rocking the world. And you, mark yes. my word, if Disney spent $66 billion mm-hmm. to get a hold of and control of Fox News, okay, last week, mm-hmm. right after Rupert Murdoch's estate almost burned down in the, northern, in the Southern California fires. Mm. So what I want to know is that, you know, is their number one goal to shut down Uranium One? Because we haven't heard Bo Peep for the last week out of Fox News about Uranium One. Not when, in fact, the Bundy case blow-up should be rocking that whole story. You, you, and that's you got, a Harry Reid story. Yeah, you, yes. Oh, yes, yes. You, right. You got called, like I did, about the, the, from the people at the Bundy case. Uh, this thing is... Uh, any it's day. Any, oh, it's huge. Oh, is it huge? <laughs> well, you you have opened many doors, my friend, and uh, I, I know it's the Christmas season, but I'd like you to come back, and we need to we need to continue this conversation. I and, love to, Jeff. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I told you the reason I do your show is that's how I get to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a sweetheart. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Have a Merry Christmas. Okay. You too, Catherine. Talk soon. Bye. Okay. Wow. Well, there's a there's a high octane, as she said, hour, if there ever was one. And we tied a lot of things together. She put them all on the table. And don't forget, everything that you heard in the last hour is reality. No joke. We'll be right back. <laughs> 